Sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, friends, neighbors, comrades, all citizens of the world, wherever you're going, wherever you've been, and wherever you're at, we welcome you to the Live from the Heartland show on Can TV. New episodes air every Thursday at 9 p.m. Central Time in Sweet Home Chicago on Channel 21 or streaming everywhere else at cantv.org. I'm your host, Michael James, encouraging you to take the chain from the brain to get back in the people's game because it's time to move from the lower level to the higher, from the shallower to the deeper, from the one-sided to the many, and from the abstract to the concrete. So without further ado, let's get it on. I'm your host, Michael James. I'm here in Chicago. I'm up in the 49th Ward. And today we're going to welcome two guests. We're going to have my friend David Dorado Romo from El Paso, and he's going to come on and talk about the history of barbed wire and what's going on on the border. And we're going to have a renowned blues man, John Primer, coming on, telling us about things he's done and things that are coming up. So stay tuned here for the next hour. You're going to have a real good time. Some good things. Uh, the Pope, the Vatican have okayed the blessing of same-sex marriage. About time. I sometimes get an email and then I go to the website of an outfit called Spark of Genius. Good news for humankind. I've mentioned them before. Just reading their headlines this week, they report that Thailand is to legalize same-sex marriage. Somalia has secured 4.5 billion debt relief and a deal with international creditors. An historic ruling in Ecuador has returned the ownership of ancestral lands to the Sikopo people. Colorado will become the first state to expand automatic voter registration to tribes. And the European Union has approved German state aid for early closures of coal plants. What a good idea. Some bad things. There is an ongoing rift in the Methodist Church, and apparently they're going to split up over LGBT, and that's too bad. And Jacobin Magazine, it's a socialist rag, reports that socialists in elected offices are standing up for Palestinian rights and demanding a ceasefire in Gaza. A handful of billionaires rejecting this progressive and popular agenda are trying hard to take down these anti-war lawmakers. As well, many conservative and centrist Democratic candidates are launching primary challenges against them, hoping to be the recipients of big campaign cash from the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee, APAC. Not a very good outfit. And similar pro-Israeli groups. APAC and its allies, like-minded organizations and big donors, told the New York Times that they are going to spend big, probably far more than in previous election cycles, to defeat anyone standing up for Palestine. Many of their targets are members of the Democratic Socialists of America. Okay, well, that's enough. That's some bad news, some good news first. A little quick thing, though, on sports. The Bears lost another one, which was just unbelievably hard to take. And the Bulls have been doing pretty well. And on the in memoriam front, two passings to relay. One would be the famed Chicago sculptor Richard Hunt, died in 88. A lot of public artworks. I started hearing about him in the early 60s when I was a young student at Lake Forest College. And closer to home, our friend Bob Heineman, the brother-in-law of our co-producer Katie Hogan, passed away this past week. He was a wonderful guy. You know, he was real active in the rights for all, labor organizing, the church, et cetera. Bob Heineman, you were a wonderful person, and we miss you. Okay, we're going to take a musical break, and we'll be right back with our first guest. Welcome back to Live from the Heartland. I'm Michael James, and I'm really uh, honored to be able to bring on the show today uh, one of the finest guitar players ever. Yeah. One and only John Primer. Hello to you, John. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? We're good. One of the things that I heard about you always was that you were Muddy Waters' last guitar player. I'd Indeed. love to hear about that. I took a photograph of Muddy Waters and James Cotton back in 1962. Um, but I also know that you have a, a really rich musical history. 
I mean, you've been in a number of bands. You've uh, been a lead guitar player in bands. You've fronted bands yourself. Why don't you fill us in a little, a little bit about your career, how it got started and where we're at? Well, actually, how it got started with, 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 with Muddy is I, I was a house band at Teresa Lounge with Junior Wells and all of them for about seven, seven years, seven nights a week. And um, so I played around down there every night and all every time I was down there, how I got down to Teresa was a friend of mine that was living around the corner for me and then we went down to Junior Wells Club, to the club that Junior Wells was, was there. Uh, I guess he part owner him and his wife or girlfriend. And uh, so the young man that uh, played around, played guitar and stuff, so he was a kid all down on Maxwell Street. So we did around the corner and I, I went around the corner to where they were rehearsing that one night. His name was Sam Good. And he always, he took me down. He said, hey, man, I know this band need a guitar player down on 39th Street. And I didn't know where, where he was talking about. And so when we got there, it was the place that what Junior Wells was all there all the time. You know, I mean, I think he's part owner, owned the club. So he said, I know this band that uh, need a guitar player. So I'm going down there the night. You will go down, will take me down there. I had a old car look like Beretta. Chevy stick chip on the collar. Then you, you take me down there, man. See, I said, okay, cool, man. So him and I got together the night we went down there and so now with Junior Wells was there. They had two stages. And uh, so when his band was playing called uh called uh, I think they named was the Hot Coke Unlimited or some band. And so and, and which was John Walken. And uh, John Walken was the guitar player with Willie Dixon, but not at the time. He had his own band. And so when I got there, Sam Good told John, said, hey, man, I brought this guy down here, John Farmer, to, uh, he said you need a guitar player, so I uh, brought him down here so you can uh, check him out and see if you like him. He said, okay. And so he said, when I, we talked a little bit, and he went up and played, and I went up, he called me up, and I played the whole set with him. When they took a break, he came we came down. He said, "Hey man, you sound great, man. I like the way you play." So I, I tell you something. I got this gig down at a club called Teresa. Never heard of it. I only been to Teresa Lounge. And I said, "Yeah." He said, um, "I'm quitting, so I want you to come down there." And um, well, I'm leaving. I'm leaving because I'm tired of that job. You know what the S would. I'm tired of that. You know. And uh, I don't want to curse you. Now, nah, it wasn't a curse. It's just, just, just shit. I said, y'all see it this way. Y'all ain't going to do it. I'm tired of this shit down there. Um, so I didn't know why. So yeah, I tell you what, you meet me down here Sunday. We're going to be, uh, I'm going to be rehearsing down there. And uh, uh, so to so come down and uh, rehearse with me, you know. And so, so I, that Sunday I went down there. I caught the bus and rolled down there. I, well, I, I, I'm car that, I wasn't driving the car then. So I caught the bus and and, rode and went down there. And uh, so the bus put me off on, on 49, which to reason I was on 48th Street in Indiana, South Indiana. So bus bus dropped. I got off at the wrong stop. And I was afraid because I know during the time it was the, the, the game bang was down there, different game banging, and also the Blackstone Ranger. And uh, so when that bus pulled off, I was nervous having a guitar with me. I ran. When the bus took off, I ran. I took off too. <laughs> By the time the bus made it to Teresa, to not to there, but he, she, he didn't stop there. But uh, by the time he got there, I was there too, running, keeping up with the bus. So now I go inside. I hear John walking, rehearsing for showing up down in the basement. And he was playing his music, whatever year that was. I forgot what year the Play that fucking music, white boy. It was in the steps in the 70s, 71, 72, 73, some what year it was. So now I walks in there and there this old lady sitting at the bar, sitting at the end of the bar, with an apron over and nodding, and you know, like I was sleeping. And the beer can so that day I said, mm, she must drink beer. <laughs> so now I said, hey, excuse me, ma'am. I didn't know her name. He said, I said, uh, John Watkins told me to come down here and rehearse with him today. And he was playing that song. She said, hmm, there he is back there. Just like that. So I started walking back there, and all of a sudden, a beer can came by me. And, shoom, and hit the chills and things, and 
When I got back there, John Walken looked at me and pointed his fingers. I said, see, that's what I'm talking about. And I said to myself, man, why? Why would you want me to work down here? And that lady throwing them cans at him and stuff like that. But from then on, I said, well, you know, got to take a chance. And so that Monday, he said, yes, be your money until Junior Wells. I sent you down to play in my place. I said, okay. So that Monday, I went down there. And Junior Wells showed up, Junior Wells was there. And I, I was uh, playing, sitting in with Simon Lawhorn, which was my guitar player for 15 years in the band. And um, so when Junior heard me, I guess, then I said, hey, Junior, don't want to me come down here and uh, take his play in his place, take his place. And Junior just looked at me and said, I don't care. And then from then on, I was in the house band for seven years with Junior Wells. And wow. Yeah, man. Let me, and then add, when, let, let me jump in and ask you a question. That first clip yeah. you were talking about at 39th, mm -hmm. what was the name of that? Was that the mm -hmm. Blue Flame? No, I was. I think it's called Peyton Place or something like that. Uh, I remember nice going to the Blue Flame at 39th and Drexel and seeing uh, Paul Butterfield with some of Howlin' Wolf's guys. Uh, yeah, I never knew about that one. I, I, I didn't never go there. I heard of it, yeah. but but this. Let me ask you, John. You, you came out of Camden, um, Mississippi. Yeah. What, what was life like there for you? And when did you pick up the guitar? And what brought you to Chicago? Well, actually, um, what brought when I when I learned how to play guitar because I uh, always wanted to be a, a guitar player and I always liked the music. It was just a little kid. I'd be on the floor and the, and the books come from from uh, Alden and uh, Seals and the book every magazine come every month and get the book and just turn to the guitars and just stare at the guitar. I had to be about four or five years old and. Um, at least, I, I think I'm younger than that, but but I always admired the guitars, and so I learned how to play at six years old. I learned how to play a little guitar because my cousin had one down, down the road there, and I'd go down there, get his dad play, get, you know how to play guitar. So I went, it was, his last name was Primer, too. But I would go down there and practice with him, and his oldest son could play a little bit, and you know, I, I picked it up from him, and um. So from then on, I just started playing. By six years old, I could play. I wasn't all good, but I could play. I learned how to play, yeah. So I learned how to play guitar that, during that age. And um, so when I got about about a year or so, maybe six years old, my mom, she left and came to Chicago. And uh, so that, that hurt my feeling too, because uh, she leaving me here, me and my sister, just on two of us. I'm the oldest. and well, I, I you know, cry a lot because she's gone, but all them years, I got 18 years old, she told me don't cry because when you get old, 18 years old, I'll come back old enough, and then i come back down here and get you and your sister. And she did that. Yeah, when I got 18, that's how I was able to go to Chicago. She was living in Chicago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how I made my way to Chicago. And I brought me listen to all these blues records and, and uh, that my the seven to eights and all the way down from the seven to eight all the way to the LP and the 45. I listened to all of that and I thought all those blues guys was gone, but it was and all of it was gone. You know, the blues ever. When I got Chicago, I found that hall was still alive back then. Yeah. <laughs> and so I went, wow, this is the place I'll ever be. They was all alive, yeah. And so I was happy to be. To know that they were still alive because I, I studied all their music. Yeah, from then on, I just kept studying their music. Hollywood for all those guys. I studied all music. I didn't, didn't just, just study blues. I played all kind of doo wop, rock and roll, whatever I heard I liked. And I liked all music. And I learned everything that I could because you never know, you know, a guitar, they're going to need a guitar player for a rock and roll player, or blues or something. Uh, I can play jazz too. I know how to play it, yeah. I need to play it, yeah. So, that, well, you you had that long run at Teresa's Lounge with Junior Wells. Yeah, you played with a lot of other people. Oh, you oh yeah, Willie Dixon, Muddy Waters, Magic yeah. Slim. Tell yeah. us about some of your favorite uh, experiences playing with other guys before you became a front man in your own band. Um. Well, actually, you know. I always been a front man in the band. I had one the first band I was in called the Maintainers, and I was the lead guitar player. 
then the second band after the, them guys, they kind of faded out. A few of them passed away, the drummer. And I got with another band called the, called the Brotherhood Band. I was the lead singer in there, the guitar player. I saw all we've been out been a front man with never no problem. And and down in Teresa, I was kind of the front man, you know, so Sammy Longhorn would get drunk and then I got to play. But it'd be a lot of famous guys around that's sitting there, you know, always hanging out up there and they always would take over if Sammy got drunk. He helped me out, yeah. I, I still was playing rhythm, but they would play the lead. Louis Miles and all them guys would be down there. They were famous guitar players. So I learned from all those guys. Man. So it, was, it was a great experience for me to, to know this. And Willie Dixon used to come down there to listen and rocking and singing. I asked Sammy, who's that, who that big fat man there sitting over there dancing? I'm saying it all, but it was a Hollywood tune that he the wrote. He said, oh, that's what he thinks. He was for Chess Records. Yeah, he's real famous. So from then on, and then he, he came and asked me to go to 1979 to go down to Me Mexico City. With him, he needed a guitar player. I think his guitar player was uh, had to quit or something, Mike Joe Young, or whoever was the lead guitar player. So, yeah, I said, yeah. He said, I need a guitar player to go down. Go to Mexico with me in 1979. I said, yeah. He said, would you be interested in going? I said, yes, yeah, sir. He said, you got a passport? I said, no. He said, I'll be at your house tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Take you down there, get your passport. You got the money? I said, no, I, I, I don't have much money. I don't make no money. Yeah, I make $15 a night, a weeknight, and $20 a night on set. He said, don't worry about it. You know, you can pay me later. And the passport go by $80 back then. Yeah. In that time. So he picked me up and took me down there. And then after two, three days to wait, and then we go to Mexico, and all these people was on that show. Muddy Waters, Big Joe Williams, Lavin Davis, uh, Coco Taylor, they all was on that show. And so we played, Muddy, Muddy was the head now. Willie Dixon played for Muddy. And Muddy, and Muddy Waters heard me play. And he asked Willie Dixon, who's that young man up there playing the guitar with you? And Mother said, oh, that's John Primer. He worked on Teresa Jr. Well. And Mother said, that man know my music. And so when the old band quit in 1980, he called Willie and asked, what was I at? And they got in touch with me. They sent the guy down there and asked me, do I want to play with Bud, Bud Mud, Mojo Buford? And I mean, I jumped for joy. When he said that, because I dreamed that when I was young in Mississippi that I played in Murder's band. <laughs> yeah, I did. Well, so that did. worked out. That's great. It worked out. Yeah, it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. So you got a, uh, tell me a little bit about this movie that's coming out. I know on the 20th, people can get it online. Is it called Teardrops for Magic Slim? Yeah. Uh, we we did a, a CD, live CD at Rose Lounge. And um, matter of fact, uh, and then we also did a video too with it. So, so I'm sure it's coming out. I'm sure it is, you know. So that CD is called, because uh, I played with Magic Slim 13 years long in the band I ever played with. I never had no problem with a band I played with. Uh, fired, got fired or nothing like that. You know, Willie Dixon, he, uh, I didn't get fired from Willie Dixon band. I, I I got tired of just playing, 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 and they would let me sing. So I just, I played six months with Willie and, and I just, Quit and went back down to recent, yeah. So, it was, um, so that 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 CD is now nominated for Grammy, yeah. Ah, nice. Yeah, so it's nominated. Man. Yeah, I'm nominated for Grammy Grammy Award for my uh, Teardrop uh, Magic Slim album and the tribute to Magic Slim. I hope you know. I hope you will support and uh, Magic Slim and vote for me. You know, for the uh, January the fourth, so you can get a ticket. Um, to see the Grammy announcement, the teardrop for Magic Slim live performing at Rosa Lounge. So on December 27th at 8 p.m. So you go to IVEWMUSMUSIC.COM to get your ticket and uh, so you can see it. Yeah. Is John McDonald in that band too? With John you? McDonald, the, the, all the teardrops, all the teardrops yeah. in the band. Yeah. John McDonald, Earl Howard. Uh, Daniel O'Connor, Landon Media, which is my drummer now, and um, so we all is in that in that band, yeah, yeah, yeah. John is John's been on the show. I know him. He played. I had a place called the Heartland Cafe back in the day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. 
So tell me, tell me about your current band. The current band is John Primer and the Real Deal Blues Band. And I know you're going to be at Rose's Lounge out there on Armitage in Chicago mm-hmm. on yeah. New Year's Eve. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that band came into being, what you guys have been doing, and what your plans are. Well, my harmonica player, I've been knowing him, this son of Kerry Bell, the harmonica player, but Steve Bell and Louis Bell brother, too. So uh, Steve been in my band about 30 years. I've been knowing him since he was six years old. So so he's been playing me about 30 years and a um, great harmonica player. And uh, I changed a lot of uh, like bass player now and then, but I got a bass player with a play called Dave Forte. He did it about three and a half years. And and my drummer is Lenny Media, and he also worked in Magic Slim Band, played with Magic Slim too. So he been with me 13 years. And me, I, I use four pieces mostly, but sometimes I use a keyboard player too, most of the time, yeah. But all my music got a harmonica and keyboard player on, on there, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, you're gonna be uh, you're gonna do the New Year's, New Year's Eve gig out there, right? I'm doing the New Year's gig, yeah. New Year's Eve, yeah. Finally, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what are your what are your plans with the band? Are you going on tour? Are you playing around town regularly? Well, we play a little bit around town. All the clubs that we play at every once in a while is uh, Rose of Loud, the most of the club we play at in town. And a lot of times at Blue Chicago, down on, downtown there. And uh, so I play there. And every once in a while, Buddy Guy, every Blue Moon at, at the Kingston Mine, once in a while, whenever I'm in town. But I, I'm, I travel a lot, all, all out of town. So I go for the East Coast, come to the East Coast and go. California, go to Florida, go to Germany, France. I just come from Germany all over there. And last week, four, three, four last, I was down in, in Mexico. I did the blues down there. And I got to go back to Florida and California again, coming up. And, but I got, and I'm going to Germany, uh, 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 London, coming up, going to London. So I have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things, places that I've been going. I've been all over the world. John Prime, what is your what is your favorite memory of uh, either a show you played, a concert, or someone you played with? Uh, well, the, my my memories of someone that I most I played with was a great show when I when I was with Muddy, and we played live at, at the uh, Checkerboard Live with Muddy Waters with the Rolling Stone. That was one of my that was one of my favorite, and I just did another one down in in Oxford. In uh in uh Mississippi, and uh at uh Ground Zero, and I was there a couple of weeks ago, and I played there, and that was one of my favorite plays. The Ground Zero plays is is a uh, real nice place, and it gets who showed up with Morgan Freeman was there, and I uh-huh. took pictures with him. I had fun with him, man. He's a great guy. Yeah, Morgan Freeman's a great guy. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I met Morgan. I I was working in that movie Chain Reaction, and he was in that. And yeah. I remember having a nice talk with him. He was a wonderful guy. Yeah, man, he is, man. He's something else. Come on, y'all. Come tell me, meet this man. I want to take a picture with him. And he, he grabbed me. Come on over here, take a picture. He was great, man. Was great. Well, let me just, uh, we're going to run out of time. I want to get it straight. So if people want to get some of your music, you, you got to... The CD out, John Primer and the Teardrops Tribute to yep. Magic Limb. Yep. And um, and you're going to be at Rose's Lounge uh, with your band, Real Deal Blues Band, on the uh, New Year's Eve this year. Yeah, on New Year's Eve. Yeah. Yep. Well, I hope I get to see you sooner or later. I don't know if I'm going out New Year's Eve. I'm pretty old. <laughs> oh, well, hey, hey, you know, hey, we don't get old these days. We get better. I like that. You're getting yeah. better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you you look you looking good, man. You don't look well, good. To, good to meet you. And I'll uh, when are you? Uh, how often are you at Rose's Lounge other than New Year's Eve? You've been playing there regularly, I think. Yeah, I play there pretty regularly. Uh, it's like a home base for me, Rose's Lounge, and uh, I play there maybe once or twice a month. You know. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna come out and see you. I'm gonna stay yeah. up late and come check you out. Yeah, I hope so, man. Come on by and check it out. I got. I'm playing there Wednesday night with a special uh, uh, with a with a special guest there yeah. Wednesday night. I'm playing with, with this girl. I I can't think of her name, but she got a good 
like a uh, country western band, but she kind of mixes it up with blues and stuff. So oh, I like that. Be a special guest, a guest to play with them. So, and they're very good. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, John Primer, thanks a lot for joining us on Live from the Heartland. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. I got a lot more questions. I got a, a stepfather was out of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, check out where Camden is in relation to Belmont. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, man. That's cool. Yeah. So, yeah, this is Hey, all we got to do is vote for him and see can I win this Grammy for the Teardrop, Mad to Slim Teardrop, the best traditional blues album of the year. So, I hope I get voted in there and win the Grammy. So, I hope you do yeah. too, my man. Keep my okay. fingers crossed. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Y'all have we'll a blessed you soon. All right. Everybody stay tuned. We're going to be right back with more Live from the Heartland. Stay All tuned right. here on the left end of your dial. All right now. Welcome back to Live from the Heartland. I'm Michael James here in Chicago. And those of you who listen regularly or uh, view the show know that uh, periodically I talk about El Paso and going down there. And when I first went to El Paso, probably in 2002, uh, I had the honor of meeting this young fellow named David Dorado Romo. And uh, recently, I found some photographs of him when we went across to Juarez, and I sent them to him, and he sent me back, uh, a, you know, a little greeting, and then I uh, had a link to an article he did, uh, which was basically about the sordid, backward, terrible history of barbed wire on the border. And I got a hold of him and I said, how about coming on the, the show? And, you know, I had been very impressed with you, David, when I uh, when we first met and you had just come out with a book called Ringside Seat to the Revolution. And it was like the Mexican Revolution viewed pretty much from up high on buildings on the El Paso side of the Rio Grande. And um, and it was Cinco Puntos Press. Our friends there put out the book. It's really got a lot of great pictures and a lot of information. But you didn't leave it at that. You've been doing more. And you just had an article uh, that showed up in the Washington Post. How did that come to be? And what's the article called? And what's it about? Yeah, it's the first time I write for the Washington Post. Uh, I just got a, a letter from the editor of, of Metropolis, uh, Aaron uh, Weiner and he just invited me to to submit something. So just recently, I was going through one of the neighborhoods in El Paso, and a friend of mine saw all the barbed wire that uh, Governor Abbott has put up just in the last few months. Um, and this friend of mine said, "Man, this feels like Normandy, right? There's we're just this is a war zone now. It's not our city anymore." And uh, when she said that, I said, OK, Normandy. Yeah, that, that's one of the one of the historical uh, connections that I see. But there's so much more to it. And I just pitched this art article to The Washington Post. And uh, I don't know if you want me to draw you point by point. But but yeah, they they liked the idea. And it just came out last week. Very what curious. Is, what is the actual title of the article? It's the long, ugly history of barbed wire on the U.S.-Mexico border. Yeah, and you go way back. I mean, I, you know, I've been going to El Paso now since on a regular basis since 2002. And one of the, it's pretty sad to me to see that that wall that as you drive west toward New Mexico or the other way, you know, they got these great big steel girders. Uh, and, I, you know, I don't know, I'm sure people still get over them with ladders and things like, like that. But it's really just not a very good, uh, feeling it gives one about being an American and our relationships with our with other people in other countries. And um, so you're down there and you see it all the time. So it's not just those big steel walls that are built, but now they've got along the river, they've got all kind of barbed wire. And in your article, you make connections to Nazi Germany, uh, to other places in the world. Basically, why don't you fill us in on how barbed wire has been used to uh, separate people, keep people in clothes to just do terrible things? Well, barbed wire was invented to prevent movement. But originally, it was to prevent movement of animals, cattle. So it it was, in Illinois, I understand. In Illinois, that, that, that's, that's correct. Uh, it's a farmer by the name of uh, Joseph Glidden. 
uh, patent got obtained the first patent in 1874, and yeah, they, they were trying to, to keep cattle in their place, but it had a lot of repercussions because it was a very effective way of fragmenting Native American lands. Native Americans, by the way, called it the devil's rope because it, it, it basically destroyed their traditional hunting grounds. Ranchers, they would snip the uh, barbed wire so that their cattle could roam freely. You have Mexican American villagers in New Mexico that would also snip the barbed wire of these angle land speculators that were taking away their communal lands. So from the very beginning, it had a very negative uh, connotation. Later, it's used to um, create what at that time people called concentration camps. So I actually didn't write about the connection of Nazi Germany. When you think of barbed wire and its ugliest uses, you think of no man's land in World War I. Or you think of, of course, the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And I didn't even go that far because from the very beginning, the first time that barbed wire um, is being used as part of the border, at least there were calls for it, was back in 1904. And so back then, the so-called illegal immigrants were not the Mexicans because Mexicans crossed back and forth freely. It was the Chinese immigrants. So the 1882 Chinese exclusion law. And that's the first time that um, a group is excluded from the United States based on their nationality or ethnicity. So a lot of the Chinese, in order to circumvent the surveillance in the Pacific coast, they would come down through Mexico. And today, history is repeating itself. It sure is. There is a lot of a, a lot of Chinese migration that that is going through Mexico for the very same reasons. So I talk about how in, in 1904, there really hadn't been um, any calls to use barbed wire in the border, but it had already been used in places like Cuba and like the Philippines and South Africa. So the, the three major empires that were fighting all these colonial wars at the turn of the 20th century were Spain in Cuba uh, during the Cuban revolution, you had Jose Martí who was there. And so in order for them to, to put down that revolution, they basically, the, the Spanish Empire basically put everybody in a concentration camp surrounded by barbed wire. And we don't know the exact numbers. I quoted a, a conservative uh, estimate of 60,000, mostly women and children and the elderly died in these concentration camps. The United States criticized that, but very soon, like, Within like a handful of years, they were using it in the Philippines and the brutal repression of the of Aguinaldo's revolt and, and the people of the Philippines um, rebelling. So they did the same thing that the Spaniards had done in Spain. And the estimates are about lower, about 11,000 people that died in those concentration camps. And pretty much at the same time. And most people, I think, erroneously believe that the first concentration camps were by the British in South Africa during the Boer War. And about 30,000 people died in their concentration camps. And the majority also were women and children. So that's that's part of kind of the underground, unknown history of barbed wire. Um, it wasn't until 1916 that you get uh, a National Guardsman, Vanderbilt from New York. He he leaves his uh, mansion on Fifth Avenue. He is the great grandson of of the Gilded Age of Vanderbilt, right? The one of the one of the kings <laughs> of the railroad empire. Uh, and he proposes a two thousand mile um, fence, not only a barbed wire fence, but a high voltage barbed wire fence. So he wants to just electrocute the heck out of the, as we were called back then, the greasers, right? That was the racist term that they used for, for, Mexican, uh, for Mexicans at that time and Mexican-Americans. And so while I was doing research for this article, I myself hadn't heard about the even more brutal history of high voltage uh, uh, electrified barbed wire fences. So this guy got his idea from the first um, barrier between, uh, at that time it was between the Netherlands and Belgium, 
And it was one of these German fences that that was electrified by 2,000 volts. So about 3,000 people get killed trying to cross back and forth. And we're talking about World War I, not World War II. And so the Americans are looking at what's going on over there and saying, hey, why don't we bring it down to the border? So, I mean, oof, I go I go into a whole bunch of different examples of this. But at the end of the day, at the end of my article, I said, well, remember when uh, Trump, he wanted uh, to put some alligators in a moat. I don't know if, if you recall that, right? Yeah. It's a crazy idea. And then the other idea is like, why don't we electrify uh, the fence? And I said, well, Trump, if he thought he was coming up with something new, he was like a century too late, right? People had already thought those crazy ideas back then. Well, David, didn't didn't they have uh, alligators in El Paso in a couple of pond in a park? <laughs> in a pond, not, not a, yeah, the, it, it, the, uh, the Mexican-American community knows it as La Plaza de los Lagartos, Alligator Plaza, uh, because there used to be a fountain there with some alligators that go back to the 1890s. They replaced them, of course, but back in the 1890s, it was a, um, someone from Florida gave a gift to the city of this, these tiny little alligators in a, in a cigar box. And uh, <laughs> the city leaders didn't know what to do with them. So they put them in the middle of a fountain in the downtown plaza and that became known as Alligator Plaza. But they were not as crazy as what Trump wanted to do was to put them yeah. in a boat so that they could, you know, eat up immigrants. Well, David Romo, talk a little bit more about uh, today and uh, the kind of measures that this uh, pretty right wing governor you have down there in in Texas. Although I think you're living in New Mexico, right? I'm right in the corner. You see El Paso. You can just go like three miles, not yeah. even three miles from downtown. And and there's that that corner there that, that has uh, it's called Monument Marker Number One. So you have New Mexico and you have Texas and you have the state of Chihuahua, and you can literally like step in and be in all three states almost at the same time. I actually was there once with uh a, with one of the guys from basketball in the barrio, and he told me to go over the stones. Uh, yeah. The next thing I know, the border guards were there. <laughs> Oh yeah! They oh yeah! Down, they got me. They were, walk take over. me. they were going to take me back, but it all worked out okay. But anyhow, let me get back to the topic at hand. Share a little bit about the extent of uh, the barricades that have been built along the Texas border by your governor, by the governor, by uh, Abbott, and a little bit about the general situation that you're seeing on the border these days. Yeah. So by the way, that that place that you went to when you were down here for basketball in the barrio, now you can't get to it because there's a private wall that was built by these 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 crazy uh, extremists uh, under the direction of what, what's his name? Steve Bannon. Remember, oh, yeah. he got in trouble for uh, committing fraud. Um, it, yeah, it was that whole group. So now there's a fence that you can't even walk to that place anymore. And that, that to me, you know, that, that was part of how these fences, these wars that are being fought by people in Washington uh, end up are affecting our daily life. Because, I mean, that was that was part of when, when people like yourself and others would come, I would always take them there. I thought that was just like the, the greatest spot. And now, you know, I used to ride my bike there. So... The fence has totally encroached upon our daily lives. So it's not only affecting uh, immigrants, but it's affecting all of us. I mean, it, it is so militarized down here. So yeah, I live far away from the river. I'll go jogging and I'll have helicopters kind of hovering over me, trying to figure out if I'm running because you know I'm a migrant or or what, right? So there's this, there's the sense that we are an occupied zone. Um, so just, I think, uh, if not today, just in the last couple of days, uh, there's going to be, uh, uh, a decision for, uh, the police, the Texas police force to be able to stop people and, and declare it a crime. What used to be a, a civil, a federal civil infraction is now going to be a 
the Texas, I believe, a felony, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, just the simple act of crossing the border, right? Uh, there's been all these skirmishes between, uh, at one point, like there were a large number of people that were being pushed back towards the barbed wire by the Texas National Guardsmen. And there were a lot of injuries. And I think in a, in a few cases, the Border Patrol intervened and snipped some of that wire to help out some of these immigrants that have been injured. And, and we're talking about deep injuries, you know, in their back. You know, this is racer wire. It's concertina yeah. wire that was created during World War I. Um, so there's all kinds of, it reminds me of these fence wars that I talk about, right? So there's all kinds of chaos. But the worst thing is that this place has been uglified. You know, I mean, th this place just feels like occupied America to us. There's there's a zone, which is a kind of, in, in, in my feeling, a no man's land. But it's been so normalized that some people don't even notice it. You know, they, they, they ah, that's the price we have to pay. And the, the truth is that most of the people, most fronterizos are already seeing whether we have, uh, whether we've been here for generations or not, we're seen as foreigners in our own land by these politicians in Washington. So I don't think they really care if if this sense of occupation affects our communities as well. You know, last week on my show, I had Congressman Chuy Garcia, and uh, mm -hmm. who originally came out of Durango, and he uh, he was basically talking about how you know they're talking about making a deal on the. Uh, uh, you know, around uh, Ukraine and around Israel and trying to get some kind of changes on the border. And that the, the Latin Latino caucus in the House is not at the table. They're not even being consulted. Oh, uh, man. And it's it's uh, so I think that's got to come to light a little bit more. But what's the general feeling? You said some people kind of become immune to the the situation, but how do other people see it, whether it's Latinos or Mexicans or whether it's, uh, you know, whites or blacks? How do people down there see what's going on and do they feel a threat? Um, I was down there this summer and, you know, a lot of people seem concerned about it and it's sympathetic to the situation, but I, I don't know where it's all at. And obviously it's going to have a lot of Im implications and ramifications in the on. Uh, November 2024 election. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there was this this crisis in, in December where uh, little, I mean, thousands of, of immigrants, mostly from Venezuela, Colombia, uh, Nicaragua, they came and everybody was unprepared. The city didn't have any shelters. And I remember... La Sociedad Civil, civil society, just kind of took it upon themselves. And you saw hundreds of El Pasoans just show up with food and blankets and, you know, tamales, and because people were going to freeze. I mean, it, it was below freezing. And these are people from, from South America, right, from Colombia, that, that aren't used to those kind of freezing weather. And I, I just remembered feeling, I, I volunteered in one of the shelters, Sacred Heart Church, which is right in the middle of, of Segundo Barrio, which is known as the Ellis Island of, of the border. Um, and I just remember seeing hundreds of volunteers um, just serving, serving the immigrants, right? Serving yeah. pizza. And that was my sense that there was a good vibe around it at some point. Right. Um, and then it just kept on getting more and more politicized. I mean, I just see us as a, uh, as being just pawns to these politicians. They're just playing with people's lives. And, and yeah, of course, you get Abbott coming in and shipping people from El Paso and the local mayor wanting not to declare it a, a federal uh, uh, emergency case, because once you do that, then you have Abbott bringing in the National Guards. And that's when they bring in the concertina wire. So, you know. These politicians don't give a crap. They just want to use people for to make their own political points and to drive wedges between people. 
And unfortunately, in some cases, it works. I mean, Abbott, in, in, in his cruel and vicious way, was brilliant to bus people from El Paso and other places to cities. In Chicago. <laughs> right. We're dealing with it big time up here. I mean, it's a serious issue now. Yeah. And, 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 and these guys are, you know, they have their, their think tanks churning ideas for them on how to make things as ugly as possible. So now you have uh, Trump calling immigrants all sorts of things that they're going to poison the blood of the nation. And yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a scholar. I read Mein Kampf in the original in German. And he's using those same words. And I believe it when uh, when I hear these, um, when I read these stories about how Trump, Mein Kampf, Hitler's book on his nightstand, right, before he became president, because he's he's repeating those phrases almost word by word. Do you see any shift in the electorate in Texas? I mean, I've been hearing for 20 some odd years that it was going to shift to blue. and. Uh, but Beto didn't pull it off against Abbott, although he came close when he ran for Senate. Do you see any uh, any good signs down there politically? You know, I mean, El Paso has always been uh, to the left of almost all of Texas. Most of the border has has been has has been a demo, a democratic section of of Texas. South Texas, you have. Uh, People that that are, you know, especially among the these conservative Republican, uh, the Latino vote that is uh, shifting more and more towards the Republicans. And I just see that as as just really sad. I mean, when 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 people can convince you to forget your own history and to take the sides of the colonizers. That kind of mental colonization is a huge victory for the other side, right? So that's how I see them. I see a lot of these these uh, Mexican Americans that are that have uh, taken the side of people that oppress their own communities. And unfortunately, I think I mean what I'm reading is the same thing you're reading. It's, it's happening even among the African American community. And to me, that's. Uh, uh, that's the worst forms of colonization. That's how yeah, I, I see. I don't know if it'll hold. We'll see. I got. I always. I'm an optimistic kind of a, a dude in a lot of ways. Uh, we're Dave. We're going to run out of time, so I'm going to uh, invite you back on the show. Tell me the name of your band, and then uh, next time you come on, let's talk music. All right. Yeah. The name of my band is Los Liminals. So to be liminal. It means to be an in-between person, right? To be <laughs> neither here nor there and simultaneously from both sides. All right. Well, it's great talking to you. I'm so glad we're back in touch. I want to thank you, David Dorado Romo, and I want to thank John Primer, the blues man, both for being our guests. I want to thank our engineer, Hal James, our music producer, Lynn Orman, the other producers, Tom Clark and Katie Hogan. We'll be back next week. Do good. Do good.